thank you for your nice uh, introduction. Actually, I uh, gave a talk in your department probably four or five years ago. I don't know. <laughs> now it's uh, uh, good to actually give another one because we are so close, right? <laughs> and also there are so many new developments in your department, and I am definitely are excited by the new prospect of your department. It's clearly growing very fast. You know? uh, when I came here, there was only a program, right? Now it's a full-blown department. That's great under <laughs> Michael's leadership, right? Okay, so anyway, my home department is uh, chemical and biomedical engineering, and also I have uh, uh, quite a few affiliations. And so today, actually, I will talk about uh, our research in the synthetic biology area. Many, first of all, I'll give you an overview of my research program, and then actually talk about uh, three examples in the synthetic biology area. And hopefully, you know, through these uh, three examples, you will learn what are the opportunities and challenges in this emerging uh, field. And in your department, you also have uh, a few faculty who are working in this area, like uh, Professor uh, Ting, and also I think um, uh, Professor Ma. So. Um, so, as you all know, that about technology actually uh, made a huge impact uh, in many aspects of uh, our daily lives, right? And uh, shown in the center actually is the uh, structure of cell and this uh, DNA structure. But in the eyes of a bioengineer, and many of you are bioengineers, it's really it's the uh, uh, the cell is like the uh, magic lamp, right? And the DNA is like the little genie. So ever the discovery, since the discovery of a DNA structure in the early 50s, everyone actually wanted to harness the power of DNA for various applications. And I think that's the essence of uh, biotechnology. And in the past uh, 40 years, you know, a number of uh, technologies were developed to make uh, uh, biotechnology you know, uh, viable, s s including like the recombinant DNA technology, uh, DNA sequencing technology, monoclonal antibody, side direct immunogenesis, PCR, and direct evolution, and uh, small interference RNA technology, and RPS cells. And many of the inventors for those technologies that like got the Nobel Prize, right? The most recent one, of course, is uh, uh, for uh, the inventor for the IPS cells, uh, who got the Nobel Prize last year. And uh, initially, biotech was uh, applied to the pharmaceutical area, and it's called uh, 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 red biotech in Europe. And that is the first wave of biotechnology. And then the second wave actually occurred uh, in the early 90s. That is the application of biotech to the agricultural industry. And then more recently, around like 2000, the biotech was applied to the industrial sector, mainly the chemical industry and the energy uh, industry. And uh, the field, of course, is growing, uh, the industry is growing very rapidly. But in order to make uh, uh, the biotech work, you also need to deal with the systems and uh, processing issues. So a lot of researchers will try to develop uh, better you know, protein expression systems, uh, uh, do better metabolic control, engineer the organism to produce uh, uh, products at a high titer, uh, and also de develop uh, better like uh, reactors, et cetera. And there actually is a very interesting comparison between the information technology industry we are all familiar with and the biotech industry. And for the uh, information technology, actually, the industry, it has, has the, uh, uh, the most uh, fundamental scientific breakthrough in the early 50s, which is the discovery of semiconductors. And then the key technology actually was invented in the early 60s, that is the integrated circuits. Actually, our uh, you know, UI alumnus, uh, Jack Kirby, actually is one of the inventors for the integrated circuits, and he got Nobel Prize in the 2000-something. And then, actually, the whole industry actually really took off in the early 80s, right? Mainly because uh, the, the technology development, uh, uh, which can pack more and more transistors in a smaller and a smaller volume. So this is the very large scale integrated uh, uh, transistor technology. So nowadays, uh, the, I, the smartphones you have, like iPhone, the computing power of smartphone actually exceeds the computing power of the supercomputers you know, just 20 or 30 years ago. Right? So right now, it's, uh, the technology uh, development is amazing. And then if you look at the biotech industry, it also has the biggest scientific discovery in the early 50s, that is the discovery of double-strand DNA helix, right? And then the key technology for the whole industry actually was invented in early 70s, that is the recombinant DNA technology. And then later there are many other technologies were developed as I mentioned in the first slide. And then more recently, I think synthetic biology actually became another driving force to make the industry become bigger and bigger. And uh, in the past 40 years, the biotech, you know, 
uh, produce a lot of products, right? But surprisingly, actually, the technology, actually, the biotech industry or the, or the academic lab use are still, I would call, first generation technologies. So essentially, we still rely on recurrent DNA technology, which is a cut and paste approach to actually uh, clone in you know, a foreign DNAs. And then we also rely on PCR method to amplify DNAs so that we can manipulate them easily. And then we rely on DNA sequencing technology to read out the genetic code, right? But nonetheless, you know, even those technologies are very rudimentary. The biotech industry actually is, is very successful. They produced the first uh, therapeutic protein in 1978 by Genentech, uh, Genentech. And then right now, the current market for recombinant, DNA, uh, recombinant proteins exceeds you know, more than 60 billion. But the overall biotech uh, industry is several hundred billion dollar uh, industry. Right? And uh, in the past few years, there are two actually revolutionary technologies uh, occurred in the biotech area or in the you know, biology uh, in general. So one is actually the DNA sequencing technology. And although it was developed in the early, uh, in the later 70s, but uh, more and more next generation sequencing technologies were developed in the past few years. So here I sh uh, took a few figures from the recent issue of Nature Biotech. You know. So they showed that the, 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 the DNA sequencing uh, uh, technology uh, grows you know, exponentially. Nowadays, we can sequence the uh, uh, human genome with uh, you know, uh, less than $10,000, right? And eventually, I think it will become even cheaper in the next few years. And then another technology is uh, actually DNA synthesis. So in the early 80s, you know, uh, 70s, we mainly rely on organic chemistry to synthesize those short oligos. And then later, we use the uh, biochemistry, like the DNA ligase, to synthesize uh, you know, a longer uh, DNA up to like 1 kb. And then in the recent years, I think, uh, thanks to the advances in in vivo technology, we now can build uh, uh, DNA molecules up to half a, a million base pair long, right? Or even like a one million base pair. So these are the key milestones of the large DNA molecules that are, have been synthesized. So now, actually, these technologies really begs a key question with the, uh, these kind of technologies. So in the past, we only deal with a single gene products, right? And it, yet it's very successful. So now we can manipulate you know, dozens or even hundreds or even thousands of genes you know, very rapidly. So what kind of uh, new biotech products we can make? Right? So I think that in the future, you will see more and more examples uh, on the production of chemicals and materials from renewable chemicals. And also you will see the organisms, the engineered organisms will be directly used as a therapy. Right? And, but in order to do that, of course, you have to manipulate even you need more powerful synthetic biology tools to do that. So it's not actually the, uh, the, the academic uh, uh, community became very fascinated by uh, the potential of synthetic biology. Actually, the, uh, even the public uh, uh, sector, um, uh, especially like the investment community, also became very fascinated about uh, the potential of synthetic biology. So this is a bulletin board I saw in the Logan Airport in Boston, and it's very rare because uh, typically in the airport, what you saw is those makeup advertisements or the, the cars, right, or something like uh, it's not related to science or technology. So this is the first time I've been to so many airports, right, in, uh, all over the world. This is the first time I saw a bulletin board saying that uh, you know the uh, uh, something related to science. So it says the synthetic biology could be the defining technology of the 21st century, right? So now, of course, this is gone, but it, it lasts for. A few months, <laughs> yeah. But nonetheless, it shows you the you know, excitement uh, of the investment community in synthetic biology. So then, what is synthetic biology? You know, it depends on who you talk to. You know, you may have uh, different uh, uh, definitions. And I use the definition I uh, came up uh, like a few years ago. So basically, is uh, the deliberate design of uh, improved or novel biological systems that draws the principles, especially from uh, engineering. So. It actually will involve the uh, 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 engineering at uh, different levels, such as the molecular level. Many we deal with the DNAs or proteins or RNAs, and then also we deal with the you know the pathway level, which consists uh, you know uh, many genes or the uh, network level, and then later also you know a move up is also the organism level, and then eventually is the you know uh, 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 cell communities, right, the multi cell level, uh, like a tissue engineering and these kind of things. And it involves the three you know, key components, the synthesis, the, uh, the modeling part, and also the analysis part. So 
Uh, so what are the key you know, engineering principles that we have to introduce uh, you know, into the synthetic biology? I would argue the following three. So basically is the standardization. So you want to standardize uh, those uh, uh, parts, like uh, the proteins or the genetic regulaments, right? So you can use it uh, you know, in many different uh, uh, situations. So you can build a, a complex system very quickly. And the second one is related one is the modularization. You want to actually have those parts you know, readily available. And then it, the design should be modular, so you can swap you know, the parts you know, very easily. But also, I think uh, the integration actually is the key, right? So how can you put all the parts together to make them work as a, a functional a unit? Uh, and actually, recently, actually, I uh, 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 edited a book on synthetic biology. Actually, that will be published in uh, two or three months by Elsevier. So I invited uh, a few leaders, uh, you know, in the synthetic biology area to actually write their, you know, uh, perspectives uh, on uh, what you know synthetic biology could become in in the future. <coughs> So, so I think this is a uh, you know, rapidly growing area, and my group actually is also you know, heavily involved in this uh, field. So uh, we are interested in engineering proteins, you know, pathways, and genomes, and for various applications. And as a bioengineering group, we are also very interested in developing new tools, right, for synthetic biology. So we try to address actually two key you know, challenges. So one is related to um, energy and sustainability. So we all know that the oil you know, will be used up someday, right? <laughs> it depends on who you talk to. But, so I think it's definitely needed for you know, uh, uh, developing like, uh, more sustainable ways to produce uh, chemicals uh, and drugs and uh, even fuels. And the second challenge, actually, uh, we want to develop uh, new you know, therapeutics. And that, of course, is always a challenge. And uh, so at Illinois, I do have a, a group that is focused on the engineering of microbial factories for the production of fuels and uh, natural products. So natural products actually are a major class of uh, compounds that could be potentially used as uh, drugs. And, um, um, and we try to develop a technology that can use the lignin cellulosic materials very efficiently to produce you know, a variety of uh, industrial chemicals such as uh, uh, xylitol, fluoroglucinol, and also um, uh, natural products like uh, FR eight, which is the anti-malaria compound, and also some you know uh, polyketide synthesis or non robinson peptide synthesis that synthesize those polyketides, and then also we have some efforts to produce advanced biofuels as well. And then the second theme actually is really focused on the development of uh, new therapeutic tools and agents. So we try to develop uh, those uh, small molecule regular gene expression systems we call gene switch. And also we try to develop uh, artificial nucleases that can be used to edit the uh, genomes and we call it gene scissors, right? So the, one of the uh, key applications for these tools actually is uh, you know, gene therapy. So today, actually, I will talk about uh, three examples, and one example is actually related to the engineering of artificial nucleases for genome editing. And then also recently, I was invited by Singapore government actually to set up a lab in Singapore that is uh, focused on the uh, uh, metabolic engineering or synthetic biology, you call it. So basically, we try to uh, use biomass you know, as a raw material to produce uh, uh, industrial chemicals. Because Singapore has the third world largest chemical manufacturing you know, site. Right, and uh, so my lab there actually will entirely focus on the development of uh, new systems and uh, synthetic biology tools to engineer microorganisms for production of uh, you know uh, industrial chemicals such as uh, you know butanol, adipic acid, or other you know uh, uh, industrial chemicals. And so, the in the past few years, actually, we developed a, a very uh, I think uh, effective uh, synthetic biology tool. We call it the DNA assembler. So basically, this is a tool that we can use to build a large DNA molecule very quickly. So this uh, tool actually is based on the in vivo homologous recombination uh, mechanism in yeast. And scientists actually used that mechanism to clone a single gene for decades. But no one really tried to you know, piece you know, many fragments together to build a very large DNA molecules. Because you can imagine, when you build a large DNA molecule, it requires the, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, piecing, piecing up a ligation of many fragments, right? So you don't know what will be the efficiency, right? If the efficiency is very low, then there's no point to use this uh, method. 
And so we actually developed this method to actually build large DNA molecules in a one-step fashion. We can build the large DNA molecule on a plasmid, or we can directly actually build the, uh, the chromosome, right, to make more stable expressions. So as a demonstration, we actually build a, a eight gene pathway you know, consisting uh, eight genes that are, are involved in the uh, xylocytization and the xylocytization production. So xylocytization is a neutral cyclical compound, and uh, we build the pathway in yeast, and we can actually rely on the machine digestion to check whether we have the correctly assembled pathway or not. But also we can, based on the functional assay, because the yeast cannot use xylose as a carbon source, so if the yeast containing the pathway can grow in the presence of xylose, which indicates that it has the xylose uh, uh, the functional xylose pathway, and also we can use HPLC to detect the, the final product, right? If you see the product, you know that the, you have the xylodensing pathway. So, and it turns out that this worked very well. The, actually, the efficiency is very high. We can get uh, routinely get uh, like more than 50% of the colonies with uh, correctly, you know, assembled pathways. So this is very exciting, and you know, we developed that method, and I really want to explore it for uh, various applications. Because uh, in the introduction slides, I mentioned the, the key advances in synthetic biology is the technology for DNA synthesis, right? So you really need uh, you know, the po more powerful uh, tools to synthesize the large DNA molecules, not just the, the you know, oligos that we typically do. And so we actually wanted to uh, explore applications for uh, to explore various applications. And actually at that time, we also thought about uh, you know, assemble an uh, entire genome as well, but you all probably uh, read the paper by Craig Venter. You know, he actually assembled the first microbial genome a few years ago. And actually, indeed, actually he published the paper actually uh, in PNS showing the assembly of 25 fragments into that microbial genome, I think in 2008. And our, we publish our paper just uh, two days behind, right? But I think the technology is essentially the same because he also used that uh, in vivo recombination mechanism to ligate you know, 25 fragments into the microbial genome, right? Uh, and we actually show that we can ligate 10 fragments into a, you know, like a 20 kb you know, a, a plasmid, right? So it's a different scale, but nonetheless, the principle is the same. So, because you know, it's a Craig event, I cannot compete with him directly on the genome assembly, so we have to find something that I can compete. So the one application we try to explore is really is in the natural product discovery uh, aspect. So my group has been interested in natural product biosynthesis for many years, and uh, uh, as I mentioned, the natural products are really the major source of uh, uh, drugs. And the natural products can be discovered uh, produced from uh, bacteria, fungi, and also plants, right? And here is one example, the erythromycin actually is an a anti-cancer drug and an aflatoxin, and also the, like, uh, uh, the palitexel, that is the texel, right? Used for treatment of cancers. And, uh, and, uh, and so actually someone did a, a study, so they found that more than like uh, 70, you know, close to 80% of the anti-bacteria or anti-cancer drugs on the market are actually natural products, or actually have been derived from natural products. So clearly, you know, natural products is a real major source of those uh, drugs we use. And, uh, here, actually, I took a, 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 a figure from a review article in the recent issue of Science. It shows all the drugs that have been approved by FDA in the past uh, 40, 30 years, right, to 81. So, so that one actually shows the, uh, all the you know, drugs that are, um, uh, are being approved by FDA. And as you can see, you know, the natural product derived or the natural products uh, based the drug you know, accounts uh, a large fraction of the drugs that we use today. And but unfortunately, if you look at the figure, you know, the number of new drugs uh, that have been approved by F FDA decreased right, in the past few years. And this is really the key challenge in the pharmaceutical industry right now, the so-called pipeline issue. So they couldn't actually find basically more drugs uh, by the traditional method. And this is another figure shows the, you know, the, the serious situation uh, of the drug discovery problem. And this is the figure shows all the antibiotics that uh, were discovered in the past uh, uh, 60 years, right, since you know, 1940. And as you can see, the discovery of uh, uh, natural uh, uh, antibiotics really peaked around the 60s, right? And in the past few years, the very few antibiotics that have been, you know, uh, approved or discovered. And so this is, and then as you know, that the microorganism can develop uh, resistance very quickly. So clearly there's a pressing need to identify new you know, uh, antibiotics. 
And uh, fortunately, thanks to the advances in you know, the genomics tools, especially the DNA sequencing technologies, we now actually can uh, explore those uh, um, uncharacterized uh, biosynthetic pathways that are involved in the synthesis of natural products. So far, there are actually more than, you know, uh, I think it's more than 2,000 organs that have been completely sequenced, and there are also more than like 6,000 uh, genomes that are being sequenced. So in the next few years, we'll have uh, you know, more than 10,000 uh, uh, those genomes with a complete sequence, right? And then if you look at those sequenced genomes, you immediately find that there are many, many actually those uh, uncharacterized biosynthetic pathways. Because based on bioinformatics studies, you know that they can produce some kind of uh, natural parts, but you don't know what they are producing, right? For example, Sheremises gracious. Um, people studied this uh, organism for decades, and they only discovered the six known you know, natural products. And, but if you look at the, the genome, you will find like uh, 34 clusters, right? So that means that there are at least 28 that have not been discovered. And similarly, for Sheremises acetylcola, you know, only five actually natural products biosynthetic pathway have been characterized, and there are 23 you know, putative clusters. So but this is just the you know, tip of the iceberg that tells you that there are thousands of thousands of those uh, critical pathways out there that need to be discovered. And so how we actually discover those uh, cryptic pathway. The traditional approach is really based on you know, uh, screening. So you basically grow those organisms, right? And then you do the fractionation, and then you want to see which fraction may contain you know, biological active, biologically active compounds, right? And that's a very time consuming. And also, you know, in the past, we learned that uh, uh, only like a small fraction of the microorganism can be cultivated in the laboratory. Actually, less than 1% of the microorganism could be you know, cultivated in the laboratory. So that means that there are lots of uh, you know, organisms that can produce the natural parts, but you don't know. Uh, you, you have no ability to access them. So the traditional method actually they use uh, basically is the um, a top down approach is uh, uh, starting from the native producers, you know, and then you actually isolate genomic DNA, do the fragmentation, and then you actually clone the cluster and then sequence it and then do the deletions and try to find the, the gene cluster that is uh, involved in the synthesis of uh, natural parts. And then another uh, article, uh, technology was developed last year, actually you can uh, they develop a new DNA cloning tool. Basically they can clone a large piece of DNA directly from the intact genome. So that actually is a very powerful approach based on recombinase. And then actually the approach we actually and also several other groups really try to do is really is to use synthetic biology approaches to really build the cluster you know, from bottom up <laughs> and then try to clone. So this is the review article, uh, the news and focus we wrote for the Nature Biotech uh, issue recently. And so our approach is really the bottom up. So we're basically starting from the sequence of the genomes and then try to build the large uh, uh, DNA molecule containing the gene cluster and using the, you know, the DNA assembly method I just mentioned. And then actually we express it uh, in a heterologous host and then use uh, you know, analytical chemistry tools to discover the product that uh, pr are produced by the, the cluster. And then we do the you know, kind of activity assays to see whether the act, uh, compound, uh, whether the uh, compound is biologically active or not. So the concept actually is very simple. As I mentioned, it's really is uh, rely on the DNA assembly method uh, uh, approach. So now we have the ability to build a large DNA molecules. So what we can do is that break you know, the uh, the whole into small pieces. So we can actually have the the module that is actually enable the uh, pass me the containing the gene cluster that work in different uh, organisms, like uh, you know, in uh, Streamysis, that's the host we use to build large DNA molecules, and in E. coli, so we can isolate pure DNA for you know, uh, uh, thorough analysis, and also is is the target organism, so we can make the cluster you know work in the target organism, and then we have the uh, cluster that uh, are built from uh, that is built from the fragments as well, so everything is now actually is the fragments, right? It's a functional units, but we can rely on the assembly technique to build all the things you know, uh, together. And I think in the past, it's very hard actually to manipulate uh, uh, large DNA molecules you know, using PCR method or other method because uh, 
you can only deal with a small you know, uh, DNA molecules. But in this way, because we break the large DNA molecules into small pieces, so you can use all the existing tools to manipulate them, do whatever you want. And then you rely on the high fidelity assembly to get the whole, so which is the, a whole, uh, the, the entire DNA molecule, which of course has all the manipulations you have. So that is actually a very simple concept. And uh, it will be very useful for you know, uh, discovering new tools, but all, uh, discovering new natural parts, but also you know, study the, uh, the cluster as well. So as an example, we actually, uh, uh, several years ago, we used the, the traditional method, actually the clone the uh, gene cluster involved in the spec enabling biosynthesis. And spec enabling is a polyketa that has some, you know, which has some activities. And so we actually build, we actually clone the cluster and show that it, it actually works in the, you know, um, heterosis host, so that's good. But at the same time, a group in Germany, they also cloned a cluster that is involved in the spec enabling production, but from a different organism. But they couldn't actually produce this spec enabling in a heterosis host. So we're very kind of puzzled. Why is that? So because, you know, it's kind of a similar cluster. You know, if you compare the sequence homology, it's very similar. Uh, it's 80% homology in many cases, but of course you have uh, several differences. Like the, our cluster has the three additional genes, another one don't have it, and also the regulator is different. So I thought that this actually would be a perfect uh, model system to test our synthetic biology approach for activation of uh, cryptic pathways. And this is uh, a known pathway, but it's a silent, right? So we want to see that whether we can really refact the whole pathway to see the production of the uh, compound. So what we did is that, you know, we actually identified uh, more than 10, you know, uh, uh, constituent promoters from active bacteria that can function in stromyces uh, 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 Lividens, and then actually assemble the cluster using the DNA assembly method you know, by adding uh, constituent promoters in front of every structural gene, right? And then actually, we actually expressed in heterologous host, and the efficiency is pretty high, you know, <coughs> almost 30-40% of the construct contains the, you know, four gene cluster, and when we did the, the uh, HPR, uh, Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In order to do that, actually, as I mentioned, we needed to clone like more than ten different uh, conceived promoters. And surprisingly, people worked on uh, stromyces for you know more than sixty years. But if you look at literature, there are only four known conceived promoters. And just like the E. coli, you know, we only have uh, like five promoters that we use or in yeast. So, because people don't see the need to have more, right? Just a few, that's enough. But for synthetic biology application, you really need more, right? Because you want to build a large, complex, you know, biological systems. So you don't want to use the same, you know, uh, uh, genetic element again and again. So in this case, we studied a, a screening effort to identify 10, you know, a new um, uh, consumer promoters that will work in stromyces lividens. And then we actually uh, refactored the whole pathway, and then indeed we actually now see the production of the spec enabling from that silent uh, pathway the Germany group worked on. And that's very exciting, so that at least is kind of the proof or concept study, you know, we indeed can you know, refactor the pathway and show the production of a compound. But the key challenge is that whether we can really activate a cryptic pathway. You don't know the product, right? So, so in this case, we picked a, a pathway from the stromyces uh, uh, gratia, so that was recently sequenced, uh, um, the whole genome was recently sequenced. So we actually used bioinformatics tools to identify the cluster, uh, the boundary of the cluster, right? So essentially, we, if you see that the, the transcription factors, you know that they are not likely involved in the direct synthesis of compound. It's more like in the regulations, right? And all the genes are clusters, right? So that's the advantage of working with the clusters from bacteria. And all the genes involved in the synthesis of a compound, they are clustered together. So, so you can actually identify the, the genes potentially involved in the synthesis of a, 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 a new compound. And then we actually check the, the uh, the production, uh, the, the, the using qPCR to look at the, the gene expressions, and in the control, that's the native host, we didn't see too much gene expression. That's why, you know, you couldn't see any uh, uh, target product in uh, using the native host, right? Because this is a cryptic. And then when we actually refactor the pathway using a different approach, one approach is to add just one promoter in front of the entire pathway. One is that actually you actually add the promoter in front of each you know, structural gene. So we have different strategies. And the one actually with the individual promoters works the best. As you can see, this one actually you show the uh, mRNA expression for every structural gene, right? So that's actually is, uh, very good. Compared to other ones, you still have some issues. 
And then we actually run the HPLC, you know, to find out whether we have any new compound or not. And indeed, actually, if you compare with the control uh, with only the empty plasmid, we do see actually uh, some new peaks. And then we use actually HPLC to purify those uh, peaks, right? And then we did a very extensive uh, you know, 1D and 2D NMRs to really determine the chemical structure. And I will not actually bore you, bother you, uh, uh, <clears throat> with all the details. So we actually were able to actually figure out uh, the exact chemical structure of the uh, compound, right? And then we did uh, actually assign find the search of the literature, entire literature, and these are the two new compounds that have never been reported. So then this is just some data you know, from a 2D NMR. And, uh, uh, and then, of course, you know, with uh, uh, this result, then we can also do further magnetic studies because we can actually delete the genes very easily, right? You can remove every gene in the structural gene uh, in the pathway and see what kind of intermediate uh, produced. Then you can actually know, you know, the functions of those individual genes, right? And uh, this is kind of the proposed mechanism. You know, you can f try to figure. And this is still ongoing, right, for the magnetic studies. And, but this is just one example. And in my lab, we also try to you know, really explore the generality of this approach. So we actually uh, are working on a few clusters from fungal species and also from other streamysis uh, species. So we really want to see that uh, whether we can use this uh, approach to discover many you know, uh, novel natural products. <coughs> okay, so that's my first story. And then the second story actually is about uh, biofuel production. And once again, I will show you how we can use the DNA assembler method I just talked about to optimize the pathways for production of biofuels. And so this uh, project is mainly funded by EBI, you know, the Energy Biosciences Institute. And so in this case, uh, you know, we try to engineer uh, yeast strand that can utilize the lignin cellulosic materials to produce advanced biofuels. But I will not talk about all the projects we are working on in this bigger program project. I only want to talk about one specific uh, project in which we try to overcome the glucose repression problem in mixed sugar fermentation. So the glucose repression actually is a common problem. So it actually um, uh, exists in almost all organisms. So when you have a mixture of sugars like glucose, xylose, uh, arabinose, and then glucose is always used first, and then followed by other, you know, pentose sugars, and this actually is not a problem, right? You know, uh, for the cells, but it is a problem for industrial production of a certain compound, because this will basically reduce the overall productivity, because you have to wait, you know, the glucose used up and then use the other sugars, so that's not very efficient. So ideally, we want to have an organism that can use all the sugars simultaneously, right? So that one can shorten the you know, time for production. And so several years ago, we actually came up with a, a strategy to overcome this uh, uh, glucose repression problem by reconstituting a cell bios utilizing a pathway in yeast. Because in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, there's no pentose-specific transporters. So they only use the hexose transporter. There are more than 20 hexose transporters to transport both glucose and other sugars, like uh, xylose. And uh, in the presence of glucose, those transporters can only transport uh, glucose, not other sugars. That's why there is a repression, right? That, that is one of the reasons why you know, the, glucose, uh, the other sugars are not used right away. And then also, uh, when the glucose is inside a the cell, they also will repress the pentose utilization pathways, and the, oh no, the, the metabolism that is involved in the pentose utilization is the uh, phos pentose phosphate uh, uh, pathways, right? So our idea is to really create a, 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 a new pathway that can you know, uh, use glucose directly. So like the cell bios essentially is a dimer of glucose. We actually use a, a cell bio specific transporter to transport the cell bios into the cell and then that one be converted to glucose by a single enzyme beta glucosidase and then the glucose will be used right away by the TCA cycle right or the glycolysis pathways so you will not accumulate <coughs> so that you will not repress the pentose utilization pathway so essentially by reconstituting a new pathway for cell bio utilization we can actually uh, really remove the two repressions mechanisms uh, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae has for you know, pentose utilization. 
And so this uh, 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 concept actually is based on a discovery made by my collaborator at uh, UC Berkeley, Jamie Case's group. So they actually discovered uh, the cell bio specific transporter from neural spur across uh, and showed that it's very specific. It can only transport those uh, cell bios or cell trials in those uh, uh, short you know, oligo, uh, saccharides. And so we actually use the DNA sample method to make like six, you know, different pathways because we have three, you know, cell bios transporter uh, available and also two beta glucoses at that time. So we construct the six, you know, pathways and see that uh, whether this will work or not. And indeed, it actually worked. The, it worked. So as I shown here, you know, for the control without the cell bio specific uh, uh, utilization pathway, you will see only the xylose is utilized, but the cell bios is not utilized at all. While for the strain with the the cell bios utilization pathway, you will see the co-utilization of the xylose and the glucose, right? And uh, but uh, for, unfortunately, the productivity is very, still very low. You know, you will see the the, the uh, not here. It's a point uh, like five, you know, gram per liter per hour. You know, you, you, in for industrial application, you need at least two gram per liter per hour that kind of uh, productivity. So then we actually basically have to do further engineering on the pathway, right? So then we actually came up uh, the uh, method called the compact. So it's based on the DNA assembly method I just mentioned. So we call it the customized optimization of metabolic pathways by combinatorial transcription engineering. So essentially, we actually create a library of promoters in front of uh, you know, each structure gene and then rely on the DNA assembly method to create a library of pathways. Right, with the different you know, expression levels. So it's a very simple concept. And then you actually rely on the you know, screening method or hyperprotein method to identify the pathways with uh, you know, a high flux of productivity. Right? So, so, so we can actually uh, optimize the pathways very quickly. And uh, we used the two pathways as a model system. One is the xylose utilization pathway, which consists of you know, three structural genes. Uh, Zalos reductase, Zalos dehydrogenase, and uh, kinase. And then also, uh, we work on the cell bios utilization pathway, which consists of only two genes, right? And so we created a library using the compact method, and we transform the library into a laboratory uh, ether strain, you know, we obtained from in vitro gene, and the library size is about 10 to the fourth, 10 to the fifth, and then we spread the whole library on the petri dish plate, and just pick the, col uh, the ones with bigger colonies, right? And then we actually do the further you know, uh, fermentation studies to verify them. And indeed, actually, we found that uh, uh, we can actually improve the uh, uh, xylose uh, rate, as I shown here. And this is the uh, wild type pathway with the um, three genes uh, controlled by the wild type promoters. And this is the one we actually, uh, after you know, the screening, we obtain one strain that shows you know, high uh, uh, xylose consumption rate and also ethanol production rate. And uh, we also you know, transform the same library to an industrial strain because industrial strain you know, is more robust than laboratory strain, <coughs> right? And, uh, uh, and so we found that uh, similarly, we can actually find uh, uh, um, uh, pathways which are more efficient. And also, very interestingly, the same pathway, when we transformed it into the industrial strain, it didn't work you know, for the wild type uh, pathway, right? Because as I showed you, you didn't see too much uh, you know, consumption, while the engineered one, of course, works very well, right? So uh, this actually really uh, highlighted the, you know, the context dependency issue of pathway engineering. And this is also a big problem, actually, in synthetic biology, right? As I mentioned in the beginning, you know, we always try to standardize things, right? But, uh, Unfortunately, those standardized parts actually will not work as you, you know, predicted or you designed because because of the context, right? Because in different cell environments, you know, they will behave differently. So, so, so this one clearly shows uh, that a context dependency issue, you know, the same pathway, the one that we optimized for the laboratory strain, when you move to the industrial strain, it will not be the best and vice versa, right? So clearly that means that we need to do the optimization in different, you know, host. And similarly, for the cell bio utilization pathway, we also have a similar results. You know, we see more dramatic uh, improvement in this case. That's the path wild type pathway, and we can see a very significant improvement, right? And we also see the similar issues <coughs> of uh, context dependence. You know, the one worked very well in laboratory strain actually is not the best one in the industrial strain, and vice versa. And uh, this is very encouraging, but of course, we want to further really improve the productivity, right? 
So we want to actually do it you know, in uh, an iterative fashion, right? not just one round. Right? So we can actually use this kind of direct evolution concept so we can you know, uh, use the, the improved pathway as the starting point for next round of improvement and we can repeat several cycles. And so we actually did a, a, a three cycles and we found that uh, yeah, indeed we can improve the uh, cell of oxidization pathway uh, uh, more, right? as I shown here. And also, uh, you know, see more ethanol production uh, here, ethanol production as well. And I don't think you need to look at all the slides. And I think uh, just need to look at the table. It's much more uh, straightforward. You know, from the wild type, you know, we can only have like a 0.4 gram per liter per hour product uh, consumption rate uh, per uh, liter per hour consumption rate. And uh, uh, but for our engineered one, we can now have um, almost tenfold improvement. And similarly, for the ethanol productivity, we also kind of improve tenfold, right? So clearly, you know, you can optimize the flux, you know, using this uh, library-based approach. And now, actually, in the remaining, uh, I don't know how many fields, uh, probably five to ten minutes, I want to talk about another project uh, that is involved in um, uh, synthetic biology. But in this case, it's more focused on biomedical applications. So uh, we are very interested in developing those uh, you know, uh, small molecule regular gene expression systems to regulate the gene expression in mammalian systems. But also we're interested in developing tools that we can use to replace the genes, correct the genes directly in the mammalian uh, 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 genome. Right? So uh, today I only want to talk about one project. So in which actually we try to develop a, a new way to uh, correct uh, the, uh, the to treat the sickle cell anemia disease. And this is an inherited disease and it affects many people and uh, it is mainly caused by a single point mutation in the beta globin gene, right? So, and this is the, actually a defect the red blood cells, you will see, you know, it's, uh, it has uh, reduced the ability to transport uh, oxygen, right? So that's why if you have this disease, you know, it's uh, very dangerous. And, uh, so one way to correct this disease is to actually do ex vivo gene therapy. So you can imagine you can isolate the stem cells you know, and do the gene correction uh, of those red blood cells. And then you can grow them. Uh, and then you can put those uh, blood cells back. Right? So then they can actually, uh, actually you know, uh, to, to cure this uh, sickle cell anemia disease. And this is not just uh, not the kind of fancy. Right? It's a fancy idea. In fact, it has already improved you know, in mouse. So several years ago, there was a paper in Science that shows that uh, this uh, ex vivo gene therapy scheme did work for a mouse. So they isolated the, uh, uh, the uh, 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 hematopoietic uh, progenitor cells from the mouse, and then they did all the uh, corrections in uh, vitro, and then they put this back, and they showed that they can, they can get uh, the healthy uh, mouse back. Right? So this is actually is, uh, very exciting. But in mouse, you know, you can do the homologous recombination very uh, easily because it has a high efficiency. You can, you know, correct uh, point mutations, right? While in mammalian systems, and especially human, it's very challenging. So you cannot actually, you know, replace the gene or, you know, correct, uh, correct point mutation in um, um, a human uh, cells. And so several years ago, you know, no, actually more than two decades ago, so actually uh, it was found that uh, uh, if a double strand break actually can be introduced in a target region in the chromosome, that actually will significantly increase the homologous recombination efficiency, actually by more than like a thousand fold, right? So, but the the challenging is that uh, how can you actually introduce that uh, double strand break precisely in a position on the chromosome, right? So there's no such tools, right? So you really need to develop, you know, these kind of tools. Once you have that kind of tools, then you can actually, you know, correct the point mutations or replace genes in mammalian systems. And so uh, one technology that people worked on for many years actually is the zinc finger nucleus, right? So they actually try to use the zinc finger nucleus to correct the point mutations. But uh, uh, and another technology is based on homing nucleus, uh, which is a, a special class of uh, uh, restriction enzyme that recognize like 18 base long nucleotide and then introduce double strand break. So my lab actually started working on the engineering of a homing nucleus uh, probably eight 
seven or eight years ago. So we tried to actually use the direct evolution approach to alter the sequence specificity so that we can make it recognize a, 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 a sequence related to a, like a genetic disease, <coughs> such as uh, sickle cell anemia. And we actually achieved a, a limited success. You know, we could actually uh, change the sequence specificity, but we never can change the sequence specificity such that it can cut the target sequence, mainly because the target sequence differs from the native recognition sequence by more than like eight nucleotides, right? So it's very hard to change the sequence specifically completely. So then I think about three years ago, actually, we it was published in early, at the end of 2009. You know? So we saw the paper at the end of 2009, and I immediately asked my student to change directions. So we want to work on the you know, the, the, these uh, tail effectors, mainly because I saw this uh, actually tail effector has a, a modular uh, design in the DNA binding domain. So it consists, you know, uh, several repeats, and each repeat actually will recognize a particular uh, nucleotide on the chromosome. And those repeats will act independently, right? So this is kind of the codon uh, uh, recognition, you know, for those repeats. And, uh, it, it, and also it can recognize a very long DNA sequence, you know, it's uh, up to uh, like uh, 30 nucleotides, right? Uh, and so we came up with the idea, basically modeled after the zinc finger nucleus. So we actually want to fuse the, the FOC1, this uh, restraining enzyme, uh, um, with the, the DNA binding domain. By that time, we don't know, you know, which part of the DNA binding domain we should, uh, you know, use, right? Because the tail effectors are not very well characterized. And, and, and the structure is also not known. The structure was just published uh, uh, last year, right? There were two back-to-back -back science papers, you know, showing the structure of the, uh, uh, this, uh, stru uh, of the tail effect. And it's very beautiful. You have like a wheel, you know, they just bind the, the, the DNA, uh, you know, uh, yeah, in a helical way. And, uh, and, and it's, then we actually designed this uh, called, uh, you know, tail effect nucleus, right? And we actually used the different, uh, you know, uh, N-terminus uh, fragments and also C-terminus fragment, and we test uh, different combinations, right? Want to see whether we can recognize a particular sequence or not. So we did some scaffold optimization. We created many constructs, and then found that some constructs actually indeed showed, you know, activity. Some actually you know, didn't have any activity or very low activity, right? So clearly it depends on you know, what fragments you include. And so the target sequence we have is really the sickle cell anemia disease gene, right? So we designed the, the DNA binding domain, you know, based on the code I have, you know. Oh, it's published. Basically, it's HG. You now that's the two uh, amino acid recognize uh, T, and this actually recognizes A, this recognizes C, and this is actually a part of the repeats. It's not just the two residues, right? It's a part of the repeats that actually recognize uh, the nuclear. And then we can design the DNA binding domain to recognize our target sequence. And we synthesize these uh, uh, talents, and then we use the, the uh, reporter system uh, a human reporter system. So we basically integrated the uh, defect uh, uh, green fluorescence protein gene in a green fluorescent protein gene in the uh, mammalian, uh, in the uh, HeLa cells, right? Uh, and then uh, because it had, and then we insert our target sequence into the GFP, and then the GFP, of course, will not be functional, right? Because the open reading frame is destructed. And then we actually also introduce a, a donor plasmid containing the uh, the uh, defect, uh, another uh, uh, GFP, you know, contains the sequence. Uh, so it can form the recombination, right? So then we also have another plasmid expressing the homing, not homing, the tail effect uh, nucleus. Then we co-express these two plasmid, and then if the uh, talent works, it will introduce the double strand break actually in that target site, and then the donor plasmid will be recombined, right, to the chromosome. Then you will get a, a functional GFP. So just based on for rest, a cell flow, uh, Flow cytometry, you will know whether you have the uh, uh, talent that uh, uh, works or not. So indeed, actually, we found that uh, actually 5% of the uh, mammalian cells now have uh, fluorescence, right? So that indicates that uh, some of the uh, cells uh, have uh, uh, corrected uh, uh, GFP sequence. And then that's a very exciting. So, but this is just a reporter system. So then we actually want to really work on the, you know, stem cells. So we actually obtained the, the, the induced proprotein stem cell from uh, a lab in Stanford. So they isolate, this was just published uh, two years ago. So they actually isolated those uh, stem cells from, uh, no, 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 the, 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 the red blood cells from the actual sickle cell anemia disease patient, right? So human patient. 
So then they actually did the you know, probe potency, uh, induced probe potency to get those uh, uh, cell lines. So we obtained them, and then we want to see that we can cor correct uh, you know, the mutations in those iPS cells or not. So we basically try to combine with the uh, a trans a piggyback transposon technology as well. So we design the, the talents that can introduce double strand break in a target place, and then, you know, um, uh, through homomorphic simulation, we can re recombine, and then we also use the transposon technology to remove the marker, right? So that you can have the uh, functional uh, 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 gene. You know, so this actually we find that uh, you know works. Actually, uh, we actually find uh, uh, you know four percent of the uh, iPS cells actually indeed actually was uh, corrected. So we can use the, you know the restriction digestion you know to see that uh, whether uh, the uh, the point mutation was correct or not, because uh, that mutation happens to be a restriction site, right? So if it's corrected, then you know you, you don't have that uh, uh, digestion, and then also a more definitive uh, uh, method will be the DNA sequencing. So we can sequence the genomic DNA, and we find that indeed at that position we have uh, 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 corrected the. Uh, 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 allele, because there are two alleles, and one is corrected, one is not. So that's why we have a mixture of uh, uh, nucleotide at that position. So then we actually also want to uh, study whether you know that the cleavage is uh, specific or not, because uh, there are many homologous you know uh, regions probably in the chromosome, right? So we did a bioinformatics uh, study on the entire human genome and identified a few sites that actually have a high homology to the our target sequence, and then we synthesized the. Uh, the, uh, uh, those uh, target uh, design those target uh, sites and then did the you know the report uh, studies right see that uh, whether they can cut or not and indeed actually uh, our talents cannot cut those uh, uh, related sequence at all right so that's good so that means that it doesn't uh, the, the, the talent is very specific so you know this is just the lamb data and then we actually want to make sure that the the, the iPS cells we corrected are still you know has the full probe potency so we did the chi chi you know, see, make sure all the you know chromosomes are still intact, 23 pairs, and I also did the you know the immune staining to look at all the markers right on the cell surface, make sure they are intact. And then in addition, you can do the actually kind of teratoma formation. Those are all standard cell biology studies, and uh, then we can see implant the tumors and see that the inject what kind of cells you can. Uh, 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 you, you can get uh, the, the, the cell differentiation. And we did see actually three types of cells all can be derived from our corrected uh, 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 iPS cells, right? So that's actually very encouraging. You know? And, um, but, you know, for the talents, I think one of the limitations still, the activity of those talents is uh, relatively low, right? So that's why the efficiency, you know, we can get is like 4% of the cells. Ideally, you want to get 100%, then you just need to pick you know, whatever strand you have, then it's already correct. Because uh, if it's four percent, you still do a lot of studies to get it, right? So there's a need actually to further improve the activity of the talents. So we actually decided to apply the direct evolution approach to further improve the talent activity. So we did a, create a library, you know, on the. Um, the link region and also the uh, the nucleus the domain region, and we cannot do at, at the DNA binding domain because it's a, a very repetitive. You know, it's hard to do error prone PCR. So then we actually you know use the uh, 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 screening method I just mentioned, but it's based on the east in east system, uh, and we actually did isolate a few mutants with improved. Uh, uh, activity we tested both in yeast and the human, and in compared to the control, you know, indeed it actually shows uh, improvement. And also, there was a recent uh, a Nature paper. They claimed they developed a high efficiency talents, right? So that shows you know high activity. And uh, what they found that is just one mutation here actually they actually increased the activity, and they showed that they can be used to uh, do the gene correction in zebra fish. And uh, and we obtained that construct and then compared ours with theirs. So it seems to me that uh, the original construct is uh, not as active as ours, right? And then the the the. The, the, our improved one clearly is much better than the ones they have. So, and then we also actually, you know, um, the, 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 the mutant we found actually is there's also a mutation in the Lincoln region, but it's different from what is reported. So then we also, also actually synthesized more than 10 talents that are targeting different uh, chromosome regions, right? And it showed that uh, that mutation is kind of universal. We actually showed that the, uh, the 
those uh, new talents will all have uh, improved activity. So that's great, right? So that means that you know we now have a better you know a talent design, right? That will be more efficient than the currently available ones. And then also, and as I mentioned, talent really can be used a platform for many actual applications. You know, you can fuse different uh, you know functional domains like ligand bind domain or the the, the domains that can involve the chromatin modification, right? Acceleration, disacceleration, and also you can. Uh, uh, do the uh, 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 recombinase, or you can all the activation or repression. So you can do all kinds of uh, you know genetic manipulation at the genome scale level, right? So we really try to explore this technology for all these applications, and in particular, actually recently we developed a high throughput or large scale synthesis technology. So now we can synthesize the talents, thousands of talents in a day, right? So in a robotic system, so we can synthesize the, almost the target every gene in the, in the chromosome. Right. So that's actually very exciting. So now we can really do you know, genome scale in engineering. So in summary, what I showed today is that uh, we developed a DNA assembler method that can be used for large DNA molecule construction. And we showed that we can use it uh, you know, for pathway construction, plasma construction. And Craig Venter, of course, showed that you can build uh, a microbial genomes. And then we also developed a DNA assembler method uh, you know, for discovery of uh, new uh, natural parts from uh, sequenced the microbial genomes and the metagenomes. And also we develop a DNA assembler based on a synthetic biology tools, the compact method for optimizing you know, pathways. Right? And finally, I showed that we develop a new tool for actually uh, genome editing based on the uh, talent uh, uh, nucleus. And we showed that uh, we can use talent to correct the point mutation associated with uh, sickle cell anemia disease. So finally, I want to thank the students who did the most of work. The ones who highlighted, uh, which are highlighted in red are the ones who developed the DNA assembler method many years ago. And the ones highlighted in blue are involved in the biofuel project I talked about. And the ones invited, uh, uh, involved, uh, uh, highlighted in green are involved in the natural products discovery. And then the ones invited, uh, highlighted in sign are the ones involved in the uh, talent uh, project. So. And I would like to thank your attention, and uh, I'll be happy to take questions. All right, so um, that's a very inspiring talk. Uh, do you have any questions? Mike? I have a naive question. Uh -huh. um, I, can I can see where you're inserting genes to perhaps correct the mutation, because then you're returning it back to an, an established set of pathways. When you start inserting genes to create new pathways, potentially, mm -hmm. it would seem like that would open up all kinds of potential unexpected things to occur, right? And, That's right. And yet, some of the data you're showing is you're getting the effect that you sort of programmed into it. And uh -huh. I guess I'm sort of surprised, or, or maybe I shouldn't be surprised. <laughs> That's a very good question. I think uh, someone asked me that question uh, before as well, because when you introduce uh, new genes, that is a kind of... Uh, a uh, burden for the cell already, right? Because uh, and the cell is uh, so optimized for whatever function it want to behave. So my argument is really that uh, that the the, the, the genes you in introduced actually is were not really you know uh, perturb the met uh, metabolic networks that much, right? So you control the you know expressions of these things, and then you can integrate these. Uh, um, New pathways or gene circuits with the existing you know, network, and then of course you have to do further optimization. That's the why right now genome engineering became so hot, right? So it's a kind of emerging field. You know, is because you know they realized exactly the problem you mentioned, right? So you really not just can deal with just pathway or single genes. You really have to do the engineering at the genome scale, and then you have to rely on system biology tools that actually can help you to actually you know better design or more like uh, analyze the whole systems. Yeah, I, I think that that's very actually important question actually. More questions? Yeah, uh, so the talent uh, uh, proteins that you developed, how do they compare to efficiency right now compared to like same finger replaces and other ones? Yeah. So the Actually, this is a very actually competitive area. So we just uh, wrote a, a review article like a month ago, and we collect all the papers. There are like 60 papers. But then in the past uh, month, there are more papers published. So this field is growing very rapidly, right? So, so it, you, you kind of sometimes, uh, the students also become very anxious because they always you know, worry whether they get a scoop or not. But uh, the, the, the thing that you know, if you compare 
the, the talents with the uh, zinc finger nucleus. That's the you know technology has been developed uh, for more than like 20 years. The biggest advantage of our talent is really is that it's a modular, it's very easy to design, right? You can synthesize thousands of talents in a, in a day. That's what we, I just claimed, right? And, and you can do it high through profession. And they all actually have, uh, uh, the, most of them, I cannot guarantee everyone will work, but based on the literature, it seems that 80%, 90% of them will work, right? So that's good, very high success rate. While for the, uh, the zinc fingers, uh, nucleus, uh, it's still very challenging actually to design a, a zinc finger that will recognize a specific sequence. And also the sequence it recognizes is not that long. It's usually a nu nine nucleotide, but it's a heterodimer, so you can recognize like 18. <coughs> While for talents, you can recognize uh, 20 each side, so you can recognize 40, right? So the specificity of talents is much higher than zinc finger nucleus, and also it's much easier to synthesize, as I mentioned, the talents, right? So that's, uh, and right now you can actually ask a Sigma to synthesize one uh, like a zinc finger nucleus uh, for you, but that cost like $25,000. And also that one actually, you know, it's not guaranteed because they cannot actually really make the one probably recognize your sequence, right? But for talent, it's very easy to synthesize them. And that's why so many people are now become very excited about this technology. But the disadvantage, uh, limitation of talent is that, you know, the protein size is very big because they contain so many repeats, right? So, so I can imagine the delivery will be an issue in the future. I mean, right now, we actually did all the transfection and we actually still use like a selection, you know, uh, to select the, the ones, uh, you know, with that uh, plasmid, right? Um, so I can imagine in the future the delivery may be an issue. And then also I think there's need for further engineering to kind of reduce the size of the talent. That will be a really advantage. But then just like a month ago, I think there's another new technology called CRISPR. So that one is based on the uh, Cas9 gene involved in the type 2, you know, um, uh, the bacteria uh, uh, DNA modification system. And uh, there are two back-to-back, -back, you know, science papers, you know, on this technology. So that one, once again, it will become a, a, another new genome editing tool. And uh, the advantage of that one is very even more e uh, it's much easier to think uh, to design than this one right because you only deal with the uh, rna uh, dna right you can think size different dnas but the limitation i can imagine is that uh, it only recognizes very short in a dna sequence it's only like a 14 in a long dna sequence so i can imagine that one probably will not be very specific so right now there are four like a, a, a man genome editing technologies. Home nucleus, that are kind of uh, now out of way. And think of finger nucleus, people working on more than 20 years. I think it will still actually exist. And then Talon is what developed like in the past three years, and I think it become more and more important. And then the CRISPR just developed a month ago, right? So that one, I think you will see more probably, you know, development uh, in the next few years. And we are working on that as well. So, but overall, I think you do need those kind of tools, you know, to manipulate the mammalian genomes uh, efficiently, then you can do a, a lot of things that you cannot do in the past. Um, I have two questions. Mm. When for the DNA assemblers, so, um, how many fragments uh, could it be efficiently uh, um, assembled in, in, in one reaction? Typically? We actually assemble like a 10 fragments. Now we routinely actually build uh, like a 50 KB plasmids. Okay. So the plasmid we build is all like around 50 KB, and we can you know assemble 20 fragments uh, uh, together. In one reaction. One reaction. Yeah. Nothing um, will probably more uh, general, but like just kind of, um, what do you think will be the next breakthrough in cell biology? That's very hard, and I think that, as I said, the, the biggest challenge still is actually standardization, modularization, and the system integration, and those engineering principles, right? So if you really can, you know, develop the, uh, those the technologies or the principles or algorithm, whatever you call, to make those things work, then I think that will be the true, you know, breakthrough. So now, almost every engineer they can do the, you know, this kind of uh, uh, the genetic manipulation I mentioned in their even home, at home, or in the garage, because you can buy those parts, you know, from everywhere and then just assemble them and, and you can build whatever device you want. So that, I think, it will take a long time, I don't know. Hopefully it will come someday. And uh, yeah. yeah, but I think that will be the biggest challenge and also the biggest opportunity. Um, question. Um, so you said that so uh, it seems like a lot of the engineering thing being done right now is on the <clears throat> sort of the genome sequence level. Yeah. Is there a lot of work being done yet on sort of epigenetic engineering, so like post uh, or sort of genetic modification, methylation, assimilation, that kind of thing? 
we haven't done that, but that's, that's something we are interested in. So we're collaborating with, uh, actually my friend, my former you know, classmate at UCSD. So he actually identified, uh, you know, in the chromosome, you have like a domain structures. You have a lot of uh, like uh, uh, non-coding regions, right? You know, you have some islands with all the genes together. So we actually try to use this technology basically to, you know, delete those uh, kind of non-coding regions, see that what kind of impact they have. And he's actually an expert in epigenetics. So he's really try to stand. And also I mentioned that if we can fuse the DNA binding domain with the deacetylase or acetylase, then you can also modify the, 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 the genes and see those methylation patterns, uh, what kind of impact the methylation patterns will have on the epigenetics. And definitely, epigenetics is uh, also a very interesting area that we can use this technology. Yeah, Gibson one actually we also use in my lab as well. So we use the uh, and the Golden Gate method that we use. So, we, so in my lab we ex actually use the, we're not just uh, you know married to a DNA sample, although we developed that one, but we actually use the all the you know assembly method, you know like Gibson method, the Golden Gate method, and then the DNA assembly method. For the talents, actually we all use the Golden Gate assembly method to put the pieces together, right? And the Gibson method, I think, works well for relatively small fragment, like a 10 kb or no more than 20 kb, right? So you can assemble them in vitro. I mean, the advantage is that the Gibson method is very efficient. No, not efficient. It's very quick, right? Because you do everything in vitro. And so we use that method as well. But if you really want to build a large DNA molecule, like a 50 kb, uh, you know, or even 100 kb, you know, with microbial genomes, then you have to have the uh, in vivo mechanism like a DNA assembler method. So these are different applications. I think, uh, yeah, each method has advantages and disadvantages. So you, 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 you actually depends on the project you are working on. Choose different methods. Yeah. Um, so related to the, the three kind of um, design strategies that you talked about, the standardization, the modification, and the system integration, um, it seems like the, the biggest problems um, right now is kind of getting things to work in context and maybe like the genetics. Yeah. Um, is it? possible at this point to identify other hurdles that are kind of preventing uh, synthetic biology from becoming a um, kind of a mature field? Uh, but the field is uh, right now is only like a few years old, right? So I clearly see that the more activity is uh, in, the, in the future. And uh, also the many countries now become very fascinated about synthetic biology, so they invest a lot of money actually in this area. So I'm, I'm sure that the more and more people will actually work in this area, and they all, you know, eventually I think those problems could be actually tackled and uh, or could be solved. And I think uh, that some groups actually try to uh, uh, kind of develop those insulated, uh, use insulation, basically try to add uh, some elements on those genetic uh, regulation elements, kind of insulate from the context, right? So then you can transport uh, those insulated uh, uh, kind of uh, parts and put them in different things. So uh, definitely uh, there, there are more, you know, characterization on those genetic elements uh, are needed as well. Because right now we all like say the T7 promoter or like the you know like the promoters we just use it as it is. But how much we really know? Like what kind of a sister uh, sister uh, trans like a, 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 a active acting elements are there? You don't know, right? Especially for those uh, uh, eukaryotic promoters like yeast. The promoter is so long, like one kb. So there are many actually regulatory elements in it. So we don't know what is really the essential ones that is uh, uh, probably is, you know. Uh, not a context dependent. Yeah, so I think a more characterization of the, those the genetic elements is very important. All right, so let's thank okay. another dog again for very much.